Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Forum Webinar Series. I'm Jim Igo, President and CEO of Preservation Massachusetts, and I'll be monitoring the webinar today. In case you don't know, Preservation Leadership Forum is the professional membership program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This webinar series is made possible by members of Preservation Leadership Forum. So thank you to those members who are participating today. Today's webinar is part of an ongoing series of series focusing on advocacy and preservation policy. This session will focus on advocacy requests for the 117th Congress. I know many are planning to uh, planning upcoming virtual events and visits with Congress. So hopefully this information will be useful and informative. Before we begin, I have a few technical announcements uh, for the webinar. We will take questions from the audience during the webinar. Please send questions via the Q&A function directly to panelists. You are welcome to submit at any point during the webinar, but we will be waiting until the end of the session to answer questions. You can also communicate to all participants through the chat function. Following the program, we will send out a recording of today's webinar directly to the email you use to register. And finally, all forum webinars are archived in the forum webinar library. So now I'd like to introduce the panelists for the webinar today. First, we have Tom Cassidy, Senior Advisor for Government Relations and Policy at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, who will be speaking about FY22 appropriations and funding for the Historic Preservation Fund. Next, Pam Bowman, Director of Public Lands Policy at the National Trust will provide an update on the public lands policy updates and the specific places the trust is working to protect. Following Pam, Patrick Robertson, principal at Confluence Government Relations, will talk about exciting opportunities for advancing historic tax credit improvement legislation for this Congress. And finally, Greg Paxton, executive director of Maine Preservation, will provide some thoughts about effective preservation advocacy and how Maine Preservation has built support for state and federal historic tax credits. Following um, all of the presentations, we will open up for a discussion for audience Q&A. Don't forget to answer your questions. And here uh, in front of you now on this slide is the agenda for today's webinar. Now, I'd like to turn the program over to Tom Cassidy. Tom? Well, thank you, Jim. Um... So I've been at the trust for a number of years, but if we could just go on to the next slide, please. What I want to talk about is the fiscal year 22 appropriations season and give you just a general overview. As is often the case when we are um, facing a new administration, we have a very unusual budget season. By law, the president is required to submit his budget by the first Monday in February. That very rarely happens. What we are anticipating is that later this month, the administration will submit what is ref what we call a skinny budget that will have various top line numbers, but not a lot of the programmatic detail that we expect in May. For those of you who are, you know, follow these things, uh, you know that we have these things called green books for the Park Service, for example, and the other in interior agencies that are more specific um, and far more descriptive about the programs that the president seeks funding for. Another challenge of this year um, the is that unlike the past two years, when Congress had passed a budget resolution that established top line spending numbers, that gave explicit direction to the appropriators on how much money they could spend, we don't have that now. And th it, that will occur either by legislative action or there will be what's called a deeming resolution in which the uh, appropriations leadership simply states what the amount of money they're going to be allocating. It will probably be a little bit more than last year, but these things are very, very difficult to, to, to judge. What we do expect is that the House will likely mark up their bills in June and followed then by the Senate. Um, 
but again, I would just underscore how difficult it is to predict these things. But in terms of what we can do as advocates, it is to present to the members and to the committees what our best recommendations for funding are. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? One thing um, is that we will be having new leadership on some of the committees. Um, certainly at the full committee in the House, uh, we'll have Chairwoman Rosa DeLauro, a Democrat from Connecticut, and then a new ranking, and then Kay Granger of Texas will be the ranking member. Of more specific interest for our work is the Interior Subcommittee. And there, um, Chair Betty McCollum of Minnesota has gone off to run the Defense Subcommittee and Chair Shelley Pingree from the great state of Maine will step in behind her as the chair of the Interior Subcommittee. Again, we will have David Joyce of Ohio as the ranking member. In the Senate, the big change, of course, is that the Democrats are in charge. And so uh, we have the same senior Democrat and Republican leadership at the full committee, but on the Interior Committee, we'll have a new chair. Uh, it'll be Chairman Jeff Markley from the great state of Oregon uh, Lisa Murkowski from the even greater state of Alaska, certainly landmass, uh, she will continue to be the Republican in charge of the subcommittee. And the next slide, please. Um, certainly one a program that all historic preservationists follow with great care is the Historic Preservation Fund which provides really the core funding for state and tribal historic preservation officers, and especially in recent years has provided robust funding for a set of competitive grant programs. Um, it's really due to the engagement of people on this phone, on this webinar and our congressional champions that we've had such a dramatic increase in growth of, of the HPF. And this year, we are hoping to actually hit the fully authorized level of $150 million. Now you see here just how these numbers have increased and also what the request that the trust and other organizations, notably NICSHPO and NAFPO are recommending to the uh, Congress and most significantly the appropriations committees. So we are hopeful that again, we will have robust funding. Um, the details of these programs and other priority preservation programs are all available in our third annual report of select preservation priorities for FY22 uh, appropriations. And that will soon be online and you can uh, get a copy of that. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Pam Bowman, who's the Director of Public Lands Policies for the National Trust. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we can go to the next slide. We'll wait for it to switch over. Um, I'm gonna cover a few of the preservation advocacy priorities in the public land space. And I'll start with another federal funding issue. Um, the National Park Service preserves and protects some of the nation's most iconic historic and cultural resources. Um, but unfortunately, decades of underfunding by Congress contributed to a National Park Service maintenance backlog of nearly $12 billion. Uh, the Park Service has over 40,000 assets in need of repair and about 47% of the backlog is for historic assets. And last year was really a big win for public lands and tackling uh, this issue with the passage and enactment of the Great American Outdoors Act. Uh, President Trump signed that into law in August of 2020, and it was the largest federal investment in preservation of historic and cultural resources for public lands in our generation. Uh, and the bill primarily did two things, and on deferred maintenance, uh, it gave $9.5 billion over five years for the National Park Service and other federal agencies to tackle their repair backlog. About 70% of that money went to the National Park Service at about 1.3 billion per year. And the bill also fully funded the Land and Water Conservation Fund at 900 million annually. 
Uh, next slide, please. Well, despite that big win uh, and the money uh, for deferred maintenance in the Great American Outdoors Act, uh, robust annual appropriations are still needed. Um, the Great American Outdoors Act uh, really only covered just half of the $12 billion need. And to avoid getting ourselves in a similar situation, uh, strong funding levels are key to catch up and sustain uh, the progress. Um, so I'll call your attention here to one of the preservation priorities in our annual appropriations asks that's also outlined in the report that Tom Cassidy just mentioned. Um, and this is annual funding to tackle the deferred maintenance backlog. And really there's um, the vast majority of deferred maintenance is in, uh, funded in three main categories. Um, one is uh, line item construction. And these are the projects that contain major construction or rehabilitation and replacement. Um, costing 1 million or more. Um, and this threshold has uh, changed uh, year to year. And the projects list looks out several years and many of these are multi-year projects. Um, one example is rehabilitating the elevators and the walkways at the Thomas Jefferson Memorial or another large project at Mesa Verde National Park uh, dealing with the rehabilitation and stabilization of the Chapin Mesa historical buildings located at that site. Um, so the distinction between that and repair and rehabilitation projects is that repair and rehabilitation projects are large scale repair needs. Um, they're infrequent and they are non-recurring and it's where uh, the scheduled maintenance is no longer sufficient and at a lower threshold than the line item construction projects. And finally, cyclic maintenance programs are uh, really just the routine maintenance, preventive and, and planned maintenance um, that the Park Service needs to maintain those assets. And you'll see here some of the funding levels from FY 2021 enacted and what our request is for FY 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the sites that's facing a multitude of challenges, including deferred maintenance, is the National Mall Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the spring of 2019, the Tidal Basin Ideas Lab was launched, and this multi-year effort focuses on rescuing and transforming one of the nation's most iconic memorial landscapes. And there were five landscape architecture firms that boldly and innovatively reimagined um, that space and both individually and collaboratively developed a series of proposals that launched as part of an online exhibit last year. Uh, you'll see a link here on your screen um, for TidalBasinIdeasLab.org. Uh, we encourage you to go there and learn more about the project, um, about a landscape um, that we hope will include um, a lot of the input that we've gotten so far. And part of a big part of this project is public outreach and gathering your perspectives as well. So if you go to this site and go to the challenges section, you'll be able to participate in a short survey and help impact uh, the, the efforts and the progress of this project. Next slide, please. Looks like we have a little bit of a delay. There we go. Um, then the last issue I'll mention is the recently introduced legislation regarding the landmark Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court case. Um, one of the reasons uh, the National Trust tackled this project is that uh, many in the general public are not aware that the court case was actually a consolidation of five cases, uh, including cases in the communities of South Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, and Washington, DC. Uh, this project really uh, provides an opportunity for the public to learn about all of those cases and for us to kind of uplift and share those stories uh, and, and link the to Topeka site uh, with some of these other locations. Uh, the National Park Service currently manages a site in uh, Topeka, Kansas called the Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site. And this new legislation, uh, the Brown v. Board of Education National Historic Site Expansion Act, would expand that existing site to include sites in South Carolina and also establish National Park Service affiliated areas in the other three communities. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, and finally, uh, here's some information on those two bills. Um, you'll see here that the legislation is both bicameral and bipartisan. Um, it's led in the House by Majority Whip Clyburn um, and co-sponsored by the other members of the sites that are being expanded to and introduced in the Senate uh, by Senator Coons of Delaware. Um, we're very pleased to have 100% participation by the House and Senate offices representing these locations, um, in addition to Senator Moran from Kansas, who represents uh, the existing site in Topeka. In terms of the path forward, um, we are hopeful that sometime in the spring, um, there'll be action in either the House or Senate committees um, to try to get this legislation um, advanced to either the House or Senate floor. And we really encourage all of you to um, participate in this effort. We have both a webinar series uh, that you can check out on our website. And also you'll see in the chat, we'll share a link to where you can send a letter to your member of Congress um, asking that they support this legislation as it moves forward. And if you go to the next slide, I will now hand it over to Patrick, um, our next speaker. Thanks, Pam, uh, and thank you to Tom and Shaw and the National Trust team for having me. Uh, and thanks to the 100 plus of you who are on here for listening. Um, I will start by apologizing to you all. Unfortunately, I am not a slide person. Uh, I talk for a living and I, unfortunately for you all, I do a lot of it, but I don't have slides. So you have to look at me twice, uh, once bearded and once not. So it's a good comparison shot for everybody. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the Federal Historic Tax Credit, uh, our advocacy and some of the things that are coming up. Uh, I think, uh, as Jim said, uh, and I forgot to thank Jim, so thank you, Jim, sorry. Uh, I am the lobbyist for the Federal Historic Tax Credit Coalition. I have my own firm called Confluence Government Relations and have a few other clients, but uh, for today, I'm just the HTC lobbyist and I wanna talk to you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, but let me talk big picture for a minute before we talk about the HTC. Uh, what's going on in Washington uh, as we're talking the Senate uh, is voting on the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan, which was President Biden's um, uh, sort of COVID relief proposal. It's passed through the House, it's in the Senate, it's likely to pass the Senate in the next couple of days. Uh, this is the thing that President Biden said he wanted to do out of the gate. Democrats used a process called budget reconciliation which allows bills to pass with 51 votes or 50 votes plus the tiebreaker of the, the vice president uh, through the Senate and avoid the filibuster. Uh, so that's what Democrats are doing. So this $1.9 trillion package will pass. What's in there, you might ask? Uh, so there's $1,400 checks for all Americans under a certain income level. There's an expanded child tax credit. Uh, there's expanded uh, unemployment insurance benefits. Um, there are there's state and local government aid, there's uh, money for vaccine distribution and production, and a few other things, but it is very much pandemic focused. Um, changes to community development tax credits and other tax items aren't in there. Uh, so when could we see changes to the federal historic tax credit? Well, uh, they're just over the horizon. And I'm gonna sort of walk through a quick history of 2017 through 2021, and I mean really quick. Uh, to talk about uh, what we know and, and what's coming up. Uh, we all banded together as a historic tax credit community in 2017 during the debate over tax reform uh, and successfully made the case after being bumped out that federal historic tax credits were worth keeping in the tax code. Uh, Congress altered the program a little bit, but we stayed in uh, and the market's been adjusting to that new program. At the same time, the historic tax credit coalition sort of retrenched talked to our friends at the National Trust and uh, Nick Spo and Preservation Action and other places and talked about what the program really needs. Uh, and we've got some proposals for that. Last year, the House passed a bill called HR2, uh, which was also called the Moving Forward Act. And this bill had uh, a number of infrastructure priorities, infrastructure, everything from broadband to roads to highways to the historic tax credit, frankly. Um, and the provisions that were in that bill really serve as the base for what we're hoping to do this year. Some of them are going to sound familiar and one of them is going to sound a little different. So 
Um, let me just go through the provisions that were in that bill last year uh, and that we're hoping to put in this year. And I, um, I'm on a webinar with Tom Cassidy for the first time in a very long time, which I'm really excited about. And I need to quote him uh, here just to remind everybody that uh, the federal historic tax credit is the federal government's single largest investment in preservation every year. It's a billion dollars in federal revenue that goes into preservation, uh, which is a tremendous amount and, and really helpful. And so it's a program that's been around since 1986. It took a bit of a haircut in 2017. Uh, so what do we want in 2021? What, what makes this program better? Uh, and so there are four things on a permanent basis uh, that, that we're advocating for to make the program better. Uh, increasing the credit to 30%, for projects with less than two and a half million in qualified rehab expenses, making it easier to do small projects, giving them a leg up so that those sort of big picture community impacts projects that aren't large scale uh, still get done. Making more buildings eligible for the HTC by lowering the substantial rehab threshold, uh, right? So in the law, it's called the substantial rehabilitation test. But what it means is you have to spend 100% of your adjusted basis, which either means the property has to degrade to a point where your basis in it when you buy it is very low, uh, or that you have to spend a, a really astronomical amount of money to rehab it. So now it's really the complete rehabilitation test. Let's make it substantial again at 50%. Uh, increases the value of HTCs and clears up some of the tax treatment by eliminated basis adjustment. And then makes the HTC easier to use by nonprofit organizations for things like community health centers, art centers, affordable housing, museums, uh, and a few other things. So those are the four permanent things. You've heard about a number of those before. Uh, we're still advocating for those. We're also advocating for a bump up in the credit to 30% for five years to help deal with COVID. Um, there have been a number of ill effects in the market due to the pandemic. There are worker shortages, project shutdowns, temporary shutdowns for positive tests, trouble getting materials, trouble financing, changes in financing. All of those things have added up to make the market a pretty unstable place right now. And if you want to sort of supercharge this credit, uh, these are the five things you could do to do so. Uh, the coalition is currently in talks with our four champions about potentially introducing a bill with some or all of these provisions in it. We're hoping to get an answer on that very shortly, uh, maybe even as early as late this week. Uh, but uh, the most important thing is that we get this right and get everybody on board so when something moves this year, we have a chance to be in it. So that brings up one other question that I'll answer before I uh, give up the floor here, which is, how does this thing move? What is the vehicle? Um, for those of you who have heard me talk for a while, uh, you know I talk about an infrastructure package a lot. Uh, because Congress talks about an infrastructure package a lot. There's a lot of ideas out there about how to do infrastructure. That Moving Forward Act was infrastructure. We could be in there again. Uh, I truly believe that it's a, a priority of the Biden administration to do something on infrastructure. I believe that if they do something on infrastructure, HTC has a very strong chance of being in there. Uh, they will probably start with what was in HR2, which will be great. Uh, but at the same time, there are some big political decisions to make in Washington. Is that a partisan or a bipartisan process? Does it start bipartisan and end up partisan? Do you use budget reconciliation again? Um, and a lot of those questions need to be answered. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to do the blocking and tackling to make uh, the most um, impactful positive changes to the rehabilitation tax credit since tax reform in 1986. I mean, the, those five things that I outlined would be the biggest expansion of this program since it was made permanent in law, uh, and we're closer than ever getting to those. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and I think on the, the agenda, uh, Greg is next, but I think I'm going to throw it back to Jim for just a minute before we go to Greg, because uh, I think he has something he wants to put in here. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> um, that's great information, I think, for all of us who are going to be uh, virtually meeting with staff and members of Congress next week. And, um, uh, you know, you always give us a, 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 a good roadmap um, as, as we prepare for, uh, for our work next, uh, next week. Uh, I, I, I'd like to stop and, and just take a couple of minutes and recognize 
uh, my good friend and yours, Greg Paxton. Um, Greg will be retiring after 13 years at Maine Preservation, where during that time, he advanced that organization in so many positive ways. Many of you are aware that Greg has dedicated his entire 48 year career working in historic preservation. He was the C CEO of the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation from 81 to 2008, Preservation Administrator for Historic Charleston Foundation from 77 to 81, and he also worked in Vermont from 73 to 76. Not only was Greg a professional preservationist, he has always been a mentor and a man who was always willing to give his time to work with and help others. Greg was a past trustee of the National Trust, Chair of Preservation Action, and founding chair of the National Trust Statewide and Local Partners Affiliate. And the list goes on. When the Northeast Statewides learned that Greg was taking over Maine Preservation, we were all thrilled. It took our good, our good friend Paul Brune to, to convince Greg that it would be a great move. And we all know when Paul wanted to see something good happen, he made it happen. I know I can speak for the Northeast directors, and I'm sure all of you across the country that Greg has been not only a great friend, a fantastic mentor, Greg is someone who can be counted on no matter what. I will miss Greg as I'm sure so many of you will. Um, he's telling us that in his retirement, he and his lovely wife, Lynn, and the Yellow Lab Lambert are planning to uh, get in an RV and visit every state park in the, in the country. Greg, on behalf of all of us, we wish you great health great happiness, and you deserve all of that. So, Greg. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you, Jim. I'm, uh, for once in my life, a little bit speechless uh, here. So uh, really, uh, really appreciate uh, your, your very kind uh, words. And uh, so on we go. Uh, and yeah, the best advice I've gotten is uh, for the first year in retirement, don't commit to anything. Um, so I pass along that uh, that word of uh, words of wisdom. Uh, well, uh, Shaw uh, asked me to um, sort of back clean up here and and uh, uh, address the sh uh, the small topic of pearls of wisdom about federal advocacy. Uh, so let's uh, let's see how we can uh, go here. Uh, first of all, I want to start out by saying you know we are really lucky that we work in a bipartisan field. Uh, you know, as we all know, it's nearly unique and it remains bipartisan. And I think that's a great relief really to all of us, frankly. But uh, in, in lobbying, we don't count. It's all about our Congress people. Um, it's about each of them. But uh, it's a very good thing to start out with um, as, uh, as it's hard to disagree with it. And um, I, I think getting in the door uh, early on with a positive comment is the best way you can start a meeting. Uh, so seek to establish a, a connection early on, um, and this is uh, bipartisanship is, is a really good way. Um, try to avoid showing your hand relative to your own views, except when you're confirming theirs. Um, uh, instead, uh, try to talk uh, the language of the particular uh, congressperson uh, that you're visiting. Um, and watch while you're talking with them whether they appear interested. Um, you know, if not, move on to your next topic um, or ask them a question, um, but try to get them engaged in what you're saying. Uh, try to surprise them a little bit uh, is always helpful. Um, you know, now is a particularly good time uh, to be establishing rapport with Republicans, actually, for a variety of reasons that we're all very well aware of. Uh, they need friends um, and they're in the minority. Um, but uh, appearing supportive uh, now will be appreciated and may pay dividends uh, down the road. You know, our role, of course, is not as judge, jury, or supreme being passing judgment, uh, frankly, even if you have to hold your nose. So, um, you know, a, a treat them all uh, as, as your friend uh, for that moment. Um, and uh, our, our role is to persuade them that our position has merit. Um, but it's also giving them a reason to want to work with, uh, with us or with you particularly, um, uh, because most are motivated uh, by relationships. Of course, Republicans and Democrats don't support us for the same reason. So you really need two distinct appeals 
Um, and then within that, uh, you're going to want to have specific variations targeted to each uh, member of Congress um, that you see. Uh, of course, Democrats will generally entertain uh, additional federal spending uh, if the case is good. Uh, their interest in tax credits uh, might, may be more oriented toward affordable housing um, than it is um, to um, an inner city revitalization uh, than to development uh, per se. Um, it's important uh, that you have examples from your state. Um, and if they're a representative, uh, hopefully from their district. Uh, if it's not from their district, from a nearby city uh, or town where people from their district do business. Uh, don't worry about the exact boundaries of their district as much as the region that they represent. Um, but it's great to show pictures of befores and afters, uh, the amount of, know the amount of investment that went into these projects um, and the specific outcomes, uh, such as businesses created or apartments developed. Uh, better yet, if there's a particular story uh, that they can hang on to uh, is always helpful. Um, if possible, have date, uh, data from your State Historic uh, uh, Preservation Office or from the National Park Service um, on the tax credit status of your state. Uh, if your ranking is favorable, you know, be sure to note that. That means you get more benefits uh, from this particular program than maybe other states do. Um, uh, and uh, compare the entire budget of your State Historic Preservation Office uh, to the uh, historic tax credits that took place in a given year. Um, if, again, if that's favorable, which in, in most cases it is uh, quite favorable. Um, and uh, that's a good reason for Republicans to maybe be considering uh, increasing that funding, that it allows that office to operate better. Uh, Section 106 has little or no appeal to Republicans in general and even to some uh, more conservative Democrats. Um, you know, instead stick to the arguments on which there's a uh, ROI, uh, a return on investment. Uh, grant money is less favored by Republicans uh, as well, but if you can show that matching funds were raised at the local level, that can capture their interest, uh, particularly if they think about their association with such a project, perhaps bringing some money their way. Uh, if you can show support from, uh, or better yet, have a developer be a part of your team or do a follow-up, uh, that's very helpful uh, with Republicans as well. Uh, but developers are not necessarily the strongest uh, advocates for Democrats, um, unless, of course, they support them. And, and, you know, a lot of developers are active in giving political support. So do a little bit of research, uh, and many support both uh, sides of the aisle. So, um, of course, uh, the bottom line is they're thinking about how, that, how this can help them get reelected. I uh, hate to say it, that sounds cynical. Of course, uh, a lot of them are very involved in, in a variety of issues, but they also want to get reelected. So uh, that can either be uh, by adopting a popular cause, uh, which we are in some areas uh, more than others, uh, or possibly be by, uh, by being connected uh, with those um, uh, who give to reelections, uh, which again, uh, the, the development community. Uh, be sure to tell everyone that the historic, uh, the federal historic tax credit generates more tax revenues from salaries, income taxes, um, uh, from jobs created in particular, plus sales and property taxes, than it costs the federal government. Note that the uh, HTC is reviewed by both the National Park Service and IRS, and that all the taxes are paid into the federal uh, coffers prior to the credits being available. Um, and you may want to note now that the federal credit is paid over a five-year period. So in essence, the federal government receives this boost, the surge from the tax credits upfront, and it pays off slowly over time. Uh, the most effective lobbyists are their colleagues. So use them if you can. Remind them of the support uh, of, uh, for an issue that any of their colleagues, pre uh, preferably from the same party, uh, has uh, for a particular uh, item if their party's leadership is supporting uh, or a leader, uh, even better. That may be a leader they're trying to get to, to help them in some other way. Uh, be specific about goals for each of your congressional re representatives in each of your visits. While in Georgia, I went to see Newt Gingrich uh, for yet another visit, uh, but this time he was in the Capitol as minority leader in the House prior to being speaker. We started our, our typical pitch and he said, 
I know all that, Greg. What do you want me to do? Uh, and that, <laughs> that taught me a little lesson. Um, and the lesson obviously is go in there with some, some specific things you want them to do. Uh, have that done ahead of time and be selective. Um, if you ask them to do a whole list of things, likely it's likely they're not going to do it. Um, if you ask, but do be specific about what you think you can get from each of them. Um, you may want to ask them uh, to uh, uh, be a co-sponsor of the historic tax credit bill uh, when it's reintroduced. Um, ask them to write to uh, my now Congresswoman uh, Shelley Pingree. Um, uh, as Tom mentioned, she's now the chair of the Interior Subcommittee on Appropriations. Uh, ask them to join the Preservation Caucus. That's kind of a soft ask, uh, which, by the way, uh, Shelley Pingree is uh, a long-term member. Um, but uh, it's helpful um, to get them going down uh, the path. So be very specific. Uh, one of the things we asked uh, uh, Newt Gingrich that year was to support the homeowner tax credit. Another Georgia congressman uh, who I am honored to say was, was my congressman, John Lewis, uh, also supported that bill. If that doesn't show the breadth of historic preservation, I don't know what, that, what does. Um, and that homeowner uh, tax credit, by the way, did pass both houses, but unfortunately it was wiped out in budget reconciliation, which we now all know much more about. Um, but uh, two quick, uh, talking points as I wrap up. Follow up. I had a meeting with a congressman again, which we tended to do this once a year thing. And he said, uh, you know, um, uh, we hear from you every year and we really enjoy that. Uh, we hear from the environmental community every week. So think about that. Um, what are ways in which you can follow up? And when you ask them to do something, follow up with their staff and see if they've done it. Um, and uh, finally, know what to call them. Uh, uh, some Congress women want to be called congressmen. Some chairs want to be called chairmen. Some want to be called chairs. Some want to be called chairwoman. Know the specifics about each of your the titles uh, of your people, and that will it, at least not throw them off or let them feel like you're not paying attention when you're in your meeting. So I wish you the best. Uh, we've got a great case to make. Uh, we all know that. Um, and we have very little support that produces a, uh, a tremendous amount of good. Uh, so I wish you well uh, on your visits. And back to Jim. And uh, thank you again, Jim. Thanks, Greg. That's great information. Um, you know, thank you to Greg and Patrick and Pam and Tom for, for your wonderful presentations. And we're, we're here now to answer questions that, uh, that you may have submitted. Uh, I can't see those questions, so I'm going to turn this back over to Char and Freer and Rhonda and see what you've got. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, this is Shaw. Uh, and I will uh, direct a few questions to the panelists that we've received. Uh, but I, I did want to uh, make note of one comment that we did receive from, from Roy Smith uh, in the comments about uh, an important preservationist uh, that we lost uh, this, this past, uh, past week, uh, Nellie Longsworth, um, uh, who, as we all know, is a, a great preservation advocate uh, that had an, uh, an lasting impact on our field as the first president of, of preservation action. So, so thank you, Roy, first for, for flagging that uh, um, and Nellie's contribution. Uh, one of the questions that came up, uh, this is a question for, uh, for Pam, uh, and it has to do with the uh, Great American Outdoors Act. Uh, I think this is a, a good question for the group, uh, and if you can, you can you can see in the in the Q and A feature the question. But the the, the gist of it is uh, uh, how how you were able to and the community was able to navigate the partisan environment uh, in the last Congress to to pass a bill like the Great American Outdoors Act. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you for that question. 
Well, there's probably a very long answer to that question. I think you may remember on my slide, I mentioned that it was both, um, it was two bills put together. It was both the deferred maintenance side of the legislation and also uh, the land and water conservation fund and, and full funding for that. And there have been people working on some of these issues for years and even decades. And so what you saw with that piece of legislation was the culmination of all of that work. And I think um, there were very um, strategic and targeted decisions that were made over uh, a long period of time to make sure that we were working with the broadest coalition possible. I think another priority for um, the Great American Outdoors Act was making sure that it was bipartisan. Um, and you just heard Greg talk about that being a strength of the historic preservation community to be able to um, galvanize support both on and off the hill for bicameral and bipartisan bills. Um, and that is a strength. Um, particularly in the last Congress, we saw a lot of gridlock and there were not a lot of big initiatives um, and pieces of legislation that got through. But I think part of the success for this one uh, was all of those years of advocacy, um, all of the contributions the preservation community made uh, on research um, here in Washington, talking to people on Capitol Hill, um, all of that contributed to the success. Um, and I think the second part of the question was, when did we know that victory was possible? I think I've shared this on some previous forum webinars, but um, back in the spring, a few of the bill sponsors went to the White House and met with President Trump, who later that day sent out a tweet um, calling for Congress to pass uh, both the deferred maintenance legislation and uh, the LWCF bill. And so we were able to see quick passage in both the House and Senate and got that victory in August. It's Patrick. I just want to jump in for one second and say uh, there's nothing partisan about preservation at this point. It's something that, you know, we've long had bipartisan sponsors. And as Pam noted, uh, you make choices along the way to make sure you stay bipartisan. Uh, and it always puts you in a stronger position in the long run. So um, I sort of com I want to just take a sec to commend the, the community for continuing to make that a priority so that that these issues can thrive in any atmosphere. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I do uh, have a question for Tom, and that is how might the preservation community take advantage of new support for congressionally directed spending, otherwise known as and formally known as, as earmarks? Earmarks. Um, <laughs> I'm here to testify that earmarks are what made this country great. Um, and the House has stated that there will be, they will be looking at uh, community supported projects. That's the new phrase we use for spending decisions directed by individual members. All the rules have not been, and the policies have not been um, set by the committees, but I think that each of the subcommittees will have a couple, not a lot, a couple of programs where they will consider um, these congressionally supported earmarks. Um, and they haven't really announced what they would be. It's my own, my own thought is that for the um, interior appropriations bill, it'll be a relatively small number. We're not going to be going back to the days where um, there were, you know, where half of the Save America's Treasures program, for example, was earmarked. But I do think that it's possible that we could see um, earmarks for such traditionally earmarked programs that are fairly, fairly well vetted with the Land and Water Conservation Fund and probably one of the one or more of the large EPA um, infrastructure grant programs. I think I saw in the chat, what, what are they being called? The term that the, um, anybody, up, anybody on the Hill is gonna knock, is gonna know what it, they, everybody knows what an earmark is, but the phrase that was in uh, Chairwoman DeLauro's um, statement was community supported projects. So 
Uh, and I think really it's just to be in contact with, with, with your, first, we need to know what the rules are gonna be and to see where these projects may be funded. Tom, we, we have another question that is best directed to you, I think, uh, from Miguel Asensio, uh, having to do with the underrepresented communities yes. grant. Um, yeah. And the question is, uh, uh, is that the need is, is still very great uh, and, and resources to conserve, preserve and provide additional access. Uh, we are at risk of losing critical endangered resources and we continue to grapple with our changing environment. Uh, we're losing people in these communities that hold the histories of these communities in their memories and homes, etc. What is the plan long and short term to advance the conversations regarding uh, true meaningful inclusivity as 1 million is barely enough to do much? Uh, maybe you can comment on yeah. where um, we are with that. No, I'm... Um... I'm so glad to, to have that question. And I would agree that a million dollars is not a lot, but there was no money being directed towards this program like five years ago. It was a proposal of the Obama-Biden administration and their budget, uh, but neither the, Cong neither the House nor Senate um, appropriate, appropriated any money. Uh, we were able to get it into the conference report. There was a pretty a uh, remarkable bit of advocacy that succeeded in getting a half a million dollars. And one of, you know, one of our, 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 our thoughts were, if we could at least get it started and a half a million dollars, we got it. And we kept that level. Last year, a couple years ago, we got three quarters of a million. And then last year we got a million dollars, if I recall correctly, and yes, we did. So, and these grants are very popular and they've been funding one of, one of the really um, heartwarming parts of the preservation conference last fall was so many advocates, whether they were um, properties that recognized Hispanic history or women's history or LGBTQ um, history. And these are the types of projects that this fund, small as it might be, it's designed to just address the fact that so, that so few national register nominations reflect the diverse story of all America. And if I could just go a little bit beyond that and highlight the a program that again was a priority of the Obama-Biden administration, the African-American Civil Rights Grants program, that has grown significantly over time. Um, but what I'm really proud of is that two years ago, with the support of appropriators and with, with Mr. Blumenauer, we were, and Mr. Turner and other you know, leaders in the Congress, we were able to expand the African American Civil Rights Grants to provide for, to recognize and fund rehabilitation projects uh, at sites civil rights sites for all Americans. Um, so these numbers are, um, they're not enormous, but they have grown significantly over time and they are going for very, very good projects. And I would encourage anybody who has a, uh, a preservation project that would benefit from these uh, to advance it. So thank you for the question and thanks to all for supporting these very important pro programs that we think as, as, as with TIPO funding. Um, you know, it's all about equity and inclusion and providing funding for these programs. And I would also note as well that um, SHPOs are very committed to these programs also. Uh, and it's why we're trying to get much more robust funding for the entire preservation field through the HPF. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we have another question that I think is, is a good question for Greg, and then perhaps Patrick, uh, you, could, you could weigh in afterward as well. And that's a question from Martha Harris uh, asking, could you speak to how the programs you are advocating would contribute to both historic preservation and affordable housing? And, and Greg, I thought you might be able to speak to um, 
uh, the federal historic tax credit, but also some of the innovations at the state level with the, with the main state historic tax credit. Uh, sure, Shaw. Um, you know, let me take this minute. Uh, I had made a written note on my prepared remarks, and I forgot to say it, uh, to, to talk a minute about uh, Nellie Longsworth. Um, and I really feel badly that I, I forgot that. Um, and thank you, Roy, for uh, Smith, for bringing that up. You know, Nellie uh, really was kind of our first lobbyist. Uh, you know, our field didn't start out doing a whole lot of uh, lobbying in the early days. Um, and uh, she formed this organization and went full speed ahead. Uh, Lobby Day was really, uh, uh, you know, her baby. Um, and it was, she got more than just uh, Nick Spo and, and the National Trust involved. She got the whole country involved. Uh, she had a big board uh, for preservation action um, and uh, got a state coordinator um, in uh, most, uh, virtually every state. Um, and, uh, you know, really Nellie, I think more than any single person um, was responsible for the uh, historic tax credit getting uh, put in its uh, almost current form in 1981, uh, Dan Rostenkowski, et cetera, by doing a, a kind of a grassroots movement, what was going on in various states, uh, bringing together uh, that information in, in the form of notebooks and using that as a, a way of, of lobbying. So uh, she really uh, was a, a major uh, figure in the development of our uh, field as we know it today. Um, the, the tax credits um, have been very helpful in affordable housing. About half of the credits uh, around the country go to housing. Uh, that would, of course, is always rental housing. And a lot of that rental housing is affordable. Uh, in Maine, uh, we have a state credit. Um, and the state credit uh, is about to go to 35% now for affordable housing um, and is 25% for, uh, uh, for regular uh, projects, other projects, either uh, uh, regular housing or any other project. Uh, so that's, that's quite a, a, a boost. Um, in addition, Maine has just passed um, an, a state credit for affordable housing. And these, all these affordable housing credits, the federal and state can be used with uh, the historic preservation uh, tax credit, the historic tax credit on a state and federal level. So it really provides tremendous leverage and what they've done uh, in our state is uh, focus on the 4% credit uh, because the 9% is very limited uh, because based on, on federal appropriations, uh, but the 4% is not limited. Um, and that ability to use uh, those uh, more 4% really actually helps some projects as much as the 9% or nearly as much. So uh, looking on the state level for uh, additional affordable housing a tax credit to supplement your own, and of course, uh, for a, a, a state historic tax credit is, is also very helpful as now most of the states do have. Patrick. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. I think a couple of things, uh, the coalition is working on mapping uh, some of the crossover between the affordable housing tax credit and the historic tax credit, I think we know anecdotally that there are a number of projects, but probably a fairly small percentage who use both credits. Uh, and one of the things I will note is that the change in the basis adjustment in the um, HTC improvement bill uh, would make the affordable housing tax credit easier to use with the HTC because currently uh, low income housing tax credit has no basis adjustment. Historic has 100% basis adjustment. And when you twin them, the low income portion of the project gets saddled with the HTC basis adjustment. So it turns out to be a little harder to use them together than I think we would like. So that's it's one of the ways that we're looking to increase that. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, a question for Pam, uh, and that is uh, what you foresee uh, for this Congress going forward in terms of how uh, public lands legislation uh, like the ones you've mentioned and are, are working on might move in the 117th Congress, uh, whether whether they might move as individual bills uh, or if you see them moving um, uh, as a package uh, as we've seen in, in past years. 
Um, well, I'll, I'll answer with a little bit of a caveat that um, we're still early in, in this Congress. I think it's been different than other years and that we have um, a new administration um, that's getting up to speed. Um, and we had a lot of issues, including impeachment that took up time at the beginning of the Congress. Um, the last few years, we've seen both. Um, at the beginning of the last Congress, we saw an enormous public lands package that had a lot of um, issues that the National Trust and the preservation community advocated for, including uh, bills related to uh, this Okmulgee site in Georgia, uh, HBCUs, um, and, and about other, other funding priorities. Um, but we've also seen individual bills move as well. Um, just um, a few weeks ago, the Rosenwald Schools um, legislation um, was uh, passed and, and enacted into law in, in very short order. Um, and we also saw legislation um, move on the Route 66 uh, Centennial Commission Act. So we're seeing a, a mix of both. I think it remains to be seen. I think there's a lot of um, options and we've seen in the last few Congresses um, really a strong appetite um, in both the House and the Senate to uh, push public lands packages either as a group or individually because they're so bipartisan and because they're very popular with the general public. So um, we're, we're happy at the National Trust to be playing a leading role in a lot of those bills. And we uh, have several, especially Brown v. Board that we hope will get enacted um, in this Congress. Thank you, Pam. Uh, we have another, another question for Tom, uh, and then I think we'll need to, to wrap up. So uh, we'll, we'll try to type answers into the remaining questions, but I will leave this question for, for Tom uh, from uh, Latifa Muhammad. Uh, and she is asking about funding for the Civil Rights Preservation Fund and making that available uh, to highlight the history and repurposing of equalization schools. Uh, particularly in Alabama and other southern states. Uh, but maybe you could speak a little bit more to the civil rights grants and uh, incorporate uh, the forward look to uh, reauthorization of, of HPF. I think that would be helpful for folks yeah. to hear. Um, I think the, the equal, it's a good question. I, um, Boy, and this is, goes into some of the, the details of the civil rights grant program. It might be that you have to have a, a site on the National Register, but I'm, I'm just, I wish I could tell you for sure. I, I don't know that, I don't know, have that specific detail, but certainly if, if such a school were on the National Register, um, it would support a, a nomination for the civil rights grants as I understand the situation. And then um, similarly, you know, you might look at the, the underrepresented communities grant, the, excuse me, the underrepresented communities grant program, which as one of the uh, uh, observers noted um, in the chat function, it is small, but it didn't even exist four or five years ago. And I would encourage you to take a look at it. So I hope that helps. And uh, I would encourage uh, participants to follow up uh, with, with any of the panelists uh, after the, the webinar for additional details. But now I'll turn it back over to Jim to close us out. Thanks, Shaw. And you had some great questions. So I don't know, you've got a, um, you have a keep talking slide up, oh, here we go. So keep the discussion going on Forum Connect. This is our online community for people in the business of saving places. We have active conversations happening all week on a variety of topics ranging from section 106 to women's history, uh, history at historic sites. If you haven't joined Connect yet, you should. It's a great place to keep this conversation and start more. Also, don't forget to take advantage of these additional resources on Preservation Leadership Forum. Join us on March 24th for the third part of our Tidal Basin series, this one focusing on memorials and controversy. This should be very interesting, very exciting. So thank you to everyone who attended today's webinar. A special thanks to all of our panelists, 
who did a great job today and for sharing their experiences and their expertise. Um, if you have any questions following the webinar, please don't hesitate to contact us. The email is forum at savingsplaces.org. And I want to give a special thank you to Shaw and, and Rhonda and Carl and Priya for all the work they've done in making this webinar uh, a success today. And I would say thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. And we'll see you soon.